Kennewood is such a, a destination location. We have bass fishing tournaments. Uh, people use the beaches. We get people coming in from the tri-state area to come boating here. We get more tournaments, for instance, than, than, uh, than most other lakes in New England, which is great. But if we were to have them here, we'd kind of become like uh, you know like a typhoid marriage just because of the volume of of, uh, of transient boaters that come in and out. They come in and they go to different lakes, and so um, we get them here. You know, there goes all the recreational fishing. Uh, property values will drop all along the, the entire perimeter of of uh, Candlewood Lake, which will impact all the, the towns that border it. You take the same home that's on the lake and move it somewhere inland, it loses a third of a value. So that can be translated into tax dollars and tax revenues to towns. So there's a lot of, there's a lot at stake here. So this will cause all sorts of different economic problems uh, for the, for this whole lake community area. We don't have any evidence yet that, that they are in Candlewood. I think Candlewood's in imminent danger, though. Larry Morsicano, and I am the executive director of the Candlewood Lake Authority, which is a uh, municipal agency that's serving the five towns around Candlewood. Dr. Mitch Wagner, um, professor of biology at Western Connecticut State University. Uh, I'm Dr. Ed Wong of the Department of Biological and Environmental Sciences here at Western Connecticut State University. Actually, I'm a lab scientist. I'm a molecular biologist, which means I work with uh, molecules, specifically with DNA, so I'm a molecular geneticist. And field work is one of those rare things that I do because uh, I might go out to, uh, to collect some samples, but usually I get samples from, you know, from other people who, who actually go out in the field and dig around in the dirt or the water. And once I get it into the lab, then what I do is I, I break open the, the organisms, I break open their cells, and I isolate their DNA. And so I'm more interested in their DNA than I am in the actual animal or plant or whatever organism that people go and study. So zebra mussels showed up in uh, the 1980s, in, in, at least in this region, in the Hudson River. Before that, they had started to come into the Great Lakes as a result of shipping that came from Europe. So zebra mussels are native to Europe, Central Europe around Germany, Poland, that area. And uh, international shipping brought them over. Uh, ships would dump their, their water into the Great Lakes and, and transported zebra mussels that way. In 2010, these things showed up in Lake Lilonona and Lake Zor, which are uh, impoundments downstream on the Housatonic, uh, downstream from where the water actually is pumped up to Candlewood. And so it became a, an immediate concern if they were in Lilonona and Zor, uh, where we actually pumping up uh, the, the zebra mussel, the larval form, up into Candlewood and, and um, essentially inoculating Candlewood with these things too. They were first discovered in a lake called Laurel Lake up in, in Massachusetts, western Massachusetts, just over the border from Connecticut. Um, there is a healthy population there and there's a pipe that is dumping water from that lake directly into the, into the river. And after a few years of finding zebra mussels in Laurel Lake, Massachusetts, we started to see zebra mussels appearing in the lower Housatonic or the mid Housatonic, down around uh, near Danbury and just south of there. This past year, they started to see uh, colonization over at Lilanona and Zor, which was becoming problematic. People pulling their boats out, and then, and uh, you know, if you had a pontoon boat, the, the whole, all the pontoons were encrusted with these things. These things can get inside outboard motors and can attach themselves to the bottom of docks. They will uh, attach to uh, pipes within, within uh, hydroelectric plants. They'll, they'll encrust the, the surfaces of dams. I mean, think about a place like um, Hoover Dam, okay, where they're conveying God knows how much water, and they actually use the lake 
to, to, to provide as a supply for their uh, fire suppression systems. Okay. Well, the, one of their biggest concerns is that as these things are going to clog their fire suppression systems, how would they keep those fire suppression systems clear? We're already expecting that that for uh, the average person who just goes to visit a, a body of water that has zero mussels, if they're walking on any hard surface under that's underwater, they'll probably step on these and get themselves cut up pretty good. Ecologically, you know, they they are very efficient filters. They filter, that's how they, they, they feed. They filter water and they pull all the food particles out of the water. They'll pull nutrients out of the water in the form of all those little beasties, the plankton in the in the water. And at first people will be very happy because it'll make the water more clear. And that sounds like a great thing until you realize that the clarity of the water also causes a, an explosion of the water weeds. So one of the great fears is that as these guys clear the water and uh, clarity improves, uh, greater, more sunlight will, will go, penetrate the water. All the water vegetation will then explode, which will then cause a depletion of the oxygen in the water, thus accelerating the, the problems that the zebra mussels cause. Because as, they, as the zebra mussels eat up all the plankton, then other bigger species that depend on plankton will also die. And as the uh, water weeds explode and they suck all the oxygen out of the water, then even more species will die. And so soon you're left with um, uh, either a, a thing that a body of water that's filled with lots and lots of dead things, including dead weeds eventually, and also dead zebra mussels because they'll run out of food at some point. Uh, it, it becomes quite a, an ecological mess. We have a pretty good idea of where they are and where they're not. We know how fast they're growing. We have discussed and hoped to, to test a certain technique that would keep them from coming down the Housatonic or entering the Housatonic at all. Now, one of the things that uh, we're trying, in fact, we're, we're starting a project next year with a scientist from, uh, from the, the West, Dr. Kevin Kelly. He's, in the laboratory, he's developed a way to use, uh, to bubble CO2 gas. And it turns out that at, at high enough CO2 gas levels, the, um, the water becomes acidic and the, the little larval or baby forms of the zebra mussels die. So if you can use the CO2 at pinch points, like for instance a, a small stream or a pipe that runs from a lake that has them to the Houstonic River and, and inject the CO2 there, then whatever comes out of that lake will be dead before it gets to the Houstonic River. One of the other sources of zebra mussels are recreational boaters because these things stick to the bottoms of boats. So if a boater goes to the Hudson River, sails around, picks up zebra mussels, then comes over here to Candlewood Lake and sails around without cleaning the, their hull or their bilges where, where water gets in, then they're going to transport zebra mussels over here. There's a responsibility now in trying to prevent the spread of, of zebra mussels and other invasives and there are a number of steps, not very complicated. So for instance, if you pull your boat out of the lake, check to see what's on. If, if you have plants that are attached to your trailer, get them off. If you go to Candlewood Lake, even now, you'll see signs that say, boaters, you know, clean your boats before you come. Watch out for these uh, invasive hitchhikers, which in fact these things are. So if, so if you clean, drain, and dry it, you, you will kind of decontaminate your boat. So those are the kinds of things that the boaters should be aware of. And there's a lot of information uh, on our website at the CandleLakeAuthority.org where they can get a lot of this. There's a lot of federal uh, websites and, and state websites as well where they can get a lot of this information. The, the, the point is we're trying to help out. We're trying to, to help the process of figuring out ways to manage these things and, and trying to do something useful. Are, are we going to be able to succeed? Uh, time will tell. I mean, again, the public, if the public is, is energized and aware of this, this problem, and, they're, and, and, and if the lakeshore, the lakeshore towns are committed to saying, yeah, we, we've got to you know, prevent this, this thing from getting over here, then um, we, we might be able to do it. But, you know, when it comes to nature, nature finds a way.